ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय आसी पुरांजनो नाम भाज भाजन बिहच तस्ख्यामस्ते सखा विघ्यातचेष्टि Translation by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Shila Prabhupada Ki. Thank you. <clears throat> My dear King, once in the past lived a king named Puranjana, who was celebrated for his great activities. He had a friend named Avigata, the Unknown One. No one could understand the activities of Avigata. Purport by His Divine Grace. <clears throat> Every living entity is called Puranjana. The word Puram means within this body, within this form, and Jana means living entity. Thus, everyone is Puranjana. Every living entity is supposed to be the king of his body, because the living entity is given full freedom to use his body as he likes. <clears throat> he usually engages his body for sense gratification, because one who is in the bodily conception of life feels that the ultimate goal of life. Is to serve the senses. This is the process of karma kanda. One who has no inner knowledge, who does not know that he is actually the spirit soul living within the body, who is simply enamored by the dictation of the senses, is called a materialist. A materialistic person. Interested in sense gratification can be can be called a puranjana, because such a materialistic person utilizes his senses according to his whims. He may also be called a king. An irresponsible king takes the royal position to be his personal property, and misuses his treasury. For sense gratification, the word brihaj chabaha is also significant. The word shabha means fame. The living entity is famous from ancient times, for as stated in Bhagavad Gita two twenty, najayate mriyate va. The living entity. Is never born and never dies because he is eternal. His activities are eternal, although they are performed in different types of bodies. Nahanyate hanyamane shivire. He does not die even after the annihilation of the body. Thus, the living entity. Transmigrates from one body to another and performs various activities. In each body, the living entity performs so many acts. Sometimes he becomes a great hero, just like Hiranyakashipu or Kangsa, or in the modern age, Napoleon or Hitler. The activities of such men are certainly very great. But as soon as their bodies are finished, everything else is finished. Then they remain in name only. Therefore, a living entity may be called brihaj chabaha. 
He may have a great reputation for various types of activities. Nonetheless, he has a friend whom he does not know. Materialistic persons do not understand that God is present as the super soul who is situated within the heart of every living entity. <clears throat> Although the Paramatma sits beside the Jivatma as a friend, the Jivatma or living entity does not know it. Consequently, he is described as Abhigyata Saka, meaning one who has an unknown friend. The word Abhigyata Cheshtitaha is also significant because a living entity works hard under the direction of the Paramatma and is carried away by the laws of nature. Nonetheless, he thinks himself independent of God and independent of the stringent laws of material nature. As stated in Bhagavad Gita 2.24, Achedyo yam adayo yam aklesho shosha evacha nitya sarvakata stanur achalo yam sanatanaha. This individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble and can be neither burned nor dried. He is everlasting, all pervading, unchangeable, immovable and eternally the same. The living entity is called Sanatana because he cannot be killed by any weapon, burnt into ashes by fire, soaked or moistened by water, nor dried up by the air. He is considered to be immune to material reactions. Although he is changing bodies, he is not affected by the material conditions. He is placed under the material conditions and he acts according to the direction of his friend, the super soul. As stated in Bhagavad Gita 15.15, Sarvasya chaham hridi sanavishto matat smritir jnanam apoanam cha. I am seated in everyone's heart and from me come remembrance, knowledge and forgetfulness. Thus the Lord as Paramatma is situated in everyone's heart and he gives directions to the living entity to act in whatever way the living entity desires. In this life and in his previous lives, the living entity does not know that the Lord is giving him a chance to fulfill all kinds of desires. No one can fulfill any desire without the sanction of the Lord. All the facilities given by the Lord are unknown to the conditioned soul. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai who can write like that? Hare Krishna. So Narada Muni wants to say something to King Pratichibharisa. But Pratichibharisa is, well, he's a king. Kings tend to be attached very attached. They have all facilities for sense gratification. There was a rule in the Vedic age that the king could do no wrong, which put the person who was in that position uh, in, in an awkward situation. Unless the king was actually Raj Rishi, <clears throat> unless the king was free from the bodily conception of life, he was bound to become bewildered by the position with all that facility. 
and no one could actually pull him up on it because the king could do no wrong. He was beyond the law in the Vedic age. Because a real king uh, doesn't abuse the privilege. A real leader doesn't abuse the privilege. And the faith that is inherent in that relationship and that is developed over time, uh, the two-way street of faith. Faith is a two-way street. We hear a lot about how we need to develop faith in the Lord, how we have to accept the Lord for what He is and have faith. Here, Abhigyata is described, the super soul, the Lord within the heart, <clears throat> our ever will wisher doing nothing but sanctioning and witnessing our activities, life after life, so friendly, so friendly that He arranges everything for us to fulfill whatever desires we may have had, even those we don't remember. He makes sure that we get our due, what we want. He makes sure we, we get what we want. But faith has another uh, side. We have to act in such a way as to awaken, not awaken exactly, Krishna has faith in us, but to convince the Lord that we are worthy of His faith. Think about it. You know, Father has a son, he's a big guy, huge uh, empire, business. Child is the uh, rightful heir. But if he doesn't know the business, the father isn't going to give him the business. Therefore the father tests the child. And when he has faith in the child, then he gives him the business. This is the standard of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the knowledge of the Bhagavatam. Narada Muni is going to describe Pratichibharishat to himself through the means of allegory. This person who is about to describe this king is actually Pratichibharishat himself. It's allegory. We hear that the Bhagavatam is a historic document, which it is. But the standard of knowledge is so precise that when the allegory is, when, it's, when, it, when the description is allegorical, it describes it as being allegorical and it describes what each part of the allegory actually means. And that's what we're about to hear. What this material world actually is beyond the materialistic purview of the conditioned soul. And where does it begin? Where does Prabhupada begin? The purport? At the beginning of the teachings? He begins at the beginning. He begins at the beginning. The soul is not the body. The soul is spiritual. The soul never dies. The fear that we are all grasped by in this material world is due to insufficient knowledge. It is due to ignorance of what's going to happen, especially at death. We don't know what's going to happen at death and therefore we're afraid. So the purpose of knowledge is to open our eyes and <clears throat> just as when we begin any subject, mathematics for instance, there are axiomatic truths. Axiomatic truth means a truth that must be accepted as it is, cannot be challenged, cannot be changed, 
It is axiomatic. One plus one is equal to two. <clears throat> I'm sitting in a room full of educated people. If I ask any one of you, what's nine times nine? You will say 81 without thinking. Isn't it? Well, maybe some are a little rusty because of the computer age and the uh, you know advanced calculators that we have and everything. But we had to learn this when we were in school. We sat down and we learned the multiplication tables, the division tables, the subtraction, addition. And we had to learn it cold, rote. Isn't it? And what happened? They wouldn't let us go to the second grade until we knew it cold. <clears throat> this is axiomatic truth. You can't, a first grade kid doesn't raise his hand and say, well, I don't know about that. One plus one is equal to two. What? About, I don't know. I've been thinking about it. And I think maybe it could be, no. He doesn't get the grade and he doesn't get to go to the next grade. He doesn't learn algebra. the part of the science that teaches us how to solve our problem. But the lesson of axiomatic truth is that we have to take it with us. Spiritual knowledge is no different. It's not that, oh, now we're studying Bhagavad Gita. It's the basics. Now we're finished with the basics. Now we can go on with the higher things. It doesn't work like that. You have to take what you've learned, what you've assimilated, what you've practically applied to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. It is a, a continuation, a development of knowledge. It requires surrender from the beginning. It's not that we'll learn this, we'll figure it out, and then at the end we'll surrender. You come to the first grade class, you sit in front of the teacher, one plus one is equal to two. That's it. You've got to surrender to that from the beginning. And then you get it. And then they'll teach you how to apply it to solve a problem. Algebra or geometry or trigonometry or whatever. Advanced calculus. Every teaching in every Shastra, <clears throat> in every section of every Shastra. It starts from this point. We can't give the Bhagavad Gita up. Chaitanya Charitamrita is described by Prabhupada to be the postgraduate. Huh? Bhagavad Gita is the undergraduate, Bhagavatam is the graduate. Chaitanya Charitamrita is the postgraduate study of the science of devotional service, spiritual life. In the verses themselves of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, not in the commentary, in the verses themselves, they are sprinkled all the way through with what? Verses from the Bhagavad Gita. So we have to learn this spiritual conception and not just as information, that if you get the information, and can pass your Bhakti Shastri test, then, then, you're, then you're home. You got, you're, you're okay. No. No. It's not enough to know that you're not your body. You have to act like it. So that the next time somebody comes up to you, out of, completely out of your control, and goes, <laughs> you don't go, <laughs> and become all, you know, upset and stomp off and get angry and can't do your service because I'm too disturbed. No. This is what it means to become fixed in devotional life. The nature of the material world is it gives you challenges moment by moment. The material body itself is a challenge moment by moment. The material mind is a challenge moment by moment. The process of surrender, therefore, has to go on from the beginning to the end, moment by moment. 
until we breathe our last. Of course, we're so fortunate because we have each other in this wonderful movement. And therefore, as soon as we hear that someone's approaching that moment, so many devotees come there, isn't it? If we stay, if we don't go away, if we stay, there'll be so many devotees come and surround us and chant and give us strength and help us remember. Because at that time it's difficult. It's difficult. The air has become disturbed. The, the body stops acting, stops working. We need help from our friends. Here, our real friend is being discussed, being described. Huh? Uh, Avigata, our real friend. Our real friend is unknown to the conditioned soul and can be unknown to us if we forget again. So we must constantly practice. We must constantly practice. From the beginning of the Gita, Krishna tells Arjuna, what is the actual thing going on here? He says, Vita Raga Baya Krodha Manmaya Maam Upasritaha Bahavo Jnana Tapasa Puta Madbhava Bhagata. The goal is to awaken our love for Krishna. That's fourth chapter of the Gita. You know, second chapter is the summary study. Then he starts to describe it in more systematic way. And second, third, fourth chapter. It's in the beginning. Madhbhava. This purport is about personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. Each one of us is an individual soul. And we have personal responsibility to surrender to Krishna, to take the instructions given to us by our spiritual masters, by the sadhus, by the shastra, and to carry it out, to practice it. No one can do that for us. Even you have the most powerful spiritual master. Prabhupada was the most powerful ever. But he can't do it for us. He can give us the knowledge. He can give us the understanding. But we have to apply it. That's our responsibility. That's where this two-way faith comes in. Two-way street. We shouldn't lament over anything. Because whatever happens to us in this world is a result of things that we have done and said and thought and willed in our past. Nothing happens by chance. That is called faith. And in Chaitanya Charitamrita, this faith, is, it's required. It's called in the Gita. It's, it's unflinching trust in something sublime. Which happens to be also in the fourth chapter, come to think of it. And it comes in that Vyabhasyapmi Kaabut here, a.k.a. Hakurinana verse, in the purport. Prabhupada describes this intelligence which is single-pointed, which is not bahushaka. It's not splayed out over so many things. Such a person can perform devotional service with determination. What does with determination mean? It means that in the face of obstacles, in the face of, of things that happen to us that, that might cause us to flinch, we don't flinch. In the seventh canto, seventh chapter, verses 51 and 52, Prahlad Maharaj is explaining to his classmates what it is that will actually please Krishna fully. I don't remember all the words, but what he said doesn't please Krishna fully is cultivation of brahminical qualities, 
austerity, giving charity, cultivation of knowledge, renunciation, all the things that we strive for and try to live up to and accept respect for. Prahlad Maharaj said, none of those things will satisfy Krishna completely. And so what is it? Does he say? Unflinching, unalloyed devotion to the Supreme Lord. So I ask you, what is the definition of unflinching? What is the definition of unflinching? Can you define the word unflinching without some cause or another that would make you flinch? Is there any meaning to the word unflinching without a cause to flinch? No. There is no meaning. Therefore Krishna gives you causes to flinch so that you can show Him that your faith and devotion will not flinch under any circumstances. And when you're tested, when He has faith in you, then He appears to you. Then your problems are really finished. But don't think that even in that stage there won't be tests. Bhishma Dev. Bhishma Dev was a Mahajan, one of the twelve uni- authorities in the universe. Krishna was he was so great a devotee that Krishna came to see him and paid obeisances to him when he was what? when he was lying on a bed of arrows. You think you got a problem? Huh? Your spine is a little, you know, or it's getting a little hard to bend down and pay obeisances, or, you know, whatever, the mind is a little... Think we got problems? Try lying on a bed of arrows. Even Mahajans have to face causes to flinch. So if we can adjust, this is the purpose of philosophy. This is the purpose of this knowledge. So that we can apply it into our lives, so that we will not flinch, so that we will not stop chanting Hare Krishna, so that we will not giving, stop giving ourselves to Krishna, so that we will not stop doing what our spiritual master and Krishna want us to do, so that we won't go, you know, willy-nilly, here and there, doing whatever we feel like doing. You don't have to worry. Whatever you do is a result of what you felt like doing from the past at all times. You don't have to worry about not doing what you want. Sometimes you may think, I'm being forced to do something that I don't want. That's what this agyata is all about. You don't remember. Prabhupada had this professor when he was going to college Calcutta Professor Urquhart and he was always putting forward this doubt into the students you know in those days the British were trying to convince the students Bengali students about the inferiority of their culture and their so called knowledge so he would challenge you know where is the witness he would say what is this karma business Where's the witness? It's not fair. Why should you have to do something for something you did before that you can't remember? No, there is a witness. That witness is here. And he's our friend. Just like when you're growing up, before you get to a certain age, you don't really know what you're doing and you can't remember very much. Isn't it? Two years? Who who can remember? When you're two years? No? Three years? Four? Something? One thing? Five? A little more? That's the way it is normally. But the parents, they were there. From the womb until you start to remember start to figure out how to operate the machine. 
And they can tell you why you have that, you know, dent in your head or some scar or something. Oh yeah, you slipped in a banana peel and you went boom down and you hit your head on a pointed rock and that was it. A devotee sees everything as a blessing from Krishna. Everything. Even those things that appear to be catastro catastrophic that happens in his life. Why? Because he sees the mercy of the Lord. He's convinced that the Lord loves him. He has that faith. So if we can see whatever comes our way as the mercy of Krishna and therefore take more shelter of Krishna. Vita Raga Baya Kroda Manmaya Mamupashritaha. This is what we have to do. Vita means to give up. That means we have responsibility. It's not that things happen just automatically. We have responsibility. We have to give up our what? Rag. Our attachment to the material. Baya, fear. Kroda, anger. It's our responsibility. When it comes, when they well up in the heart, we have to go to Krishna. And we have to give up that anger, give up that avarice, give up that lust. Then what? Take, by taking shelter of Krishna. By taking shelter of Krishna. Bahavo gyata tapasa. We have responsibility to learn things. We have responsibility to do austerities. But why are we doing those austerities? Puta. Puta means purified. We're not doing it to impress anybody. We're not doing it to become to a station in life where people will come and worship us. Pratishta. Worst thing. Worst thing that can happen. We're there to do, to be purified. Kaya namanasa buddhya, kevalaya, inriya rapi, yogi nam sarvasuts. The yogi, he acts simply for purification, for no other reason. The bhakti yogi also. We act for purification. We respond to those things that happen to us according to the instructions of Krishna and our spiritual masters for purification. And why? Puta mad bhava magataha to awaken our love for Krishna. Because if you awaken your love for Krishna <clears throat> when he asks you to do something there will be no argument. If you, if you love someone and they ask you to do something for them will you say no? If you actually love someone, will you say no? No. It's not possible. That's what unconditional love is. And it comes right back down to this. Right back down to this purport. You're not the body. Despite all the pains and pleasures and things that you feel in it, despite all the things that your mind goes through to tell you you are. You're not. Therefore Krishna says, Jnana Vigyana. Jnana Teham Sivigyana. Iram Baksham Yasheshtaha. Yad Yatva Neha Buyonyaj. Yatavama Vishishite. Once you learn this, there will be nothing more for you to learn. Then you can be happy. But until you apply it, until you actually apply it fully, we have to suffer. And then like Bhishma, we have to tolerate. We have to learn to tolerate. So, Narada Muni is one of the greatest spiritual masters in the history of the universe. He's speaking to a king. And what is he telling him? 
You're not your body. In the Los Angeles, 1976, Srila Prabhupada was giving a lecture. In those days, Los Angeles was really fired up. <clears throat> and I don't know if you've listened very much to Srila Prabhupada's recorded material, but in those times, Prabhupada at the end of the lecture, every lecture you would say, what? What would he say? Thank you very much. So by the time you get to thank, before the even thank came out, the devotees would just erupt. Everyone, even the little babies. It was contagious. Everyone would just erupt with enthusiasm. So this is going on day after day. So one lecture, Prophet, he stopped before he came to thank you very much. And he said, he asked us, why is it that you're coming to hear me speak every day? I'm telling you the same thing. You listen to Prabhupada's lectures very much? I listen to two or three a day, every day, for 20 years. Chronologically, traveling with Prabhupada. So, everybody kind of sat there. Why do you come to hear me speak? I'm telling you the same thing every day. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and you are His eternal servants. So everyone was like sitting there with like, you know how it was when Prophet asked a question like that? Blank stare, deer in the headlights. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, you could hardly think what to speak of. Come up with the right answer. So Prophet answered it for us. He said, it's because you have ruchi. Now this is an interesting point. Because normally when we think of ruchi, we think of a higher phase of the science of bhakti yoga. You know, after what? After nishta. But he was telling us that because we liked to hear the same thing, every day because it was true and it was coming from the right source and it was enlivening to hear we like it we liked it confirmed don't ever get tired of hearing you're not the body and think that you have to go on to something else before you develop actual ruchi to the point where you like to hear it and you can go on hearing it every day for the rest of your life. And even if you are above it, even if you don't need to hear it, there's always someone in the room who does. This is liberation. Labante Brahmanirvanam Rishiya China Kalmashaha China Dvaida Yatatmana Sarva Bhuta Hiterataha. For one who is actually liberated, Labante means you got it. You've actually got it. Brahmanirvanam, the spiritual platform. Rishiya China Kalmashaha, the Kalmasha, the dirty things are cleansed. You no longer are, are so disturbed by them. Chinat Dvaidaya Tatmana, the dualities of heat and cold and victory and defeat and pain and pleasure and, and success and failure, they no longer disturb you. They're there. They don't go away. But they're no longer so disturbing on the spiritual platform. And then, what you have left to do? Sarva, Bhuta, Hiterataha, to act for the benefit of others. This is the duty of a liberated soul. The only thing we have left to do is to act for the benefit of others, to preach Krishna consciousness. Therefore, Krishna says at the end of the Gita, this is what pleases me the most. This is what Lord Chaitanya came to give. Christian consciousness without discrimination. This is selfless service. But if you try to go to the higher things without assimilating this, 
without coming to the spiritual platform. You'll become wrapped up in you and your relationship with Krishna and that's all you'll think about and you'll forget to do good to others. And the preaching stops. This was Prabhupada's, one of Prabhupada's strongest, not fear exactly, but concerns, that the preaching would stop. Because we've been given everything. We are so fortunate we can't calculate our fortune. To be here in Vrindavan, in front of Gornitai and Krishna Balra, Alita Vishaka, Radha Sham Sundar, Srila Prabhupada, and with all the devotees. This fortune is beyond the beyond. If we're not completely ecstatic at every moment and it's increasing, then we may not have come to the point of realizing yet that we're not the body. Therefore, here we are, fourth canto, Bhagavatam, a purport which analyzes the facts that we're not the body from the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada because he never gave up. Time. Time makes everyone forget. Time, providence, causes everyone to go through difficulty. Even Bhishma Dev. So the point is not to try to avoid the difficulty. The point is to try to come to the level of consciousness whereby we can feel ecstatic under any circumstance. That is what Krishna is giving us. It's what Srila Prabhupada came to give, to give us. And it's what we are duty-bound to give to others. Then we'll be happy. Then it's finished. Business finished. Not finished, but actually the business begins. <laughs> then the real business begins. Then we can serve with love. Not because we have to. Out of affection. And what does Krishna do? He's attracted. He's attracted by that affection. By that loving service. And then he gives. Tesham satatajukdanam bhajatam priti purvakam priti purvakam with affection, with love. Dadami buddhi yogam tam I give the intelligence by which you can come to me. So we have the responsibility to behave properly. And Krishna, He is numero uno responsible. He never shirks His responsibility. You can be sure. Unflinching faith in something sublime. That is Shraddha. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Shiva Prabhupada ki. Shiva Bhagavatam ki. Shiva Dhamma Dham ki. Samabeda Bhaktivinda ki. All glories to you. Hare Krishna.